Yeah, another great point. Um, everyone is struggling to, to have the the extra hands when they need them, um, particularly in agriculture. So yeah, that's a that's another really good point. Adam has a hand up. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just wanted to to tag on to that, uh, and I'm not quite sure which one of these it might fit in, but it it fits with that theme of sort of as a producer, the unknown of the payoff was a few years ago, uh, two two years ago now, actually, we went ahead and decided to do some soil remediation in our high tunnels and brought in a bunch of compost that we'd made, uh, that we brought in from our, um, from our pasture and tilled that in to the high tunnels. And then it took us most of a season to finally diagnose what was wrong with our plants. And we, it didn't even click that we had sprayed that pasture three years beforehand for, with herbicide. And uh, it, it uh, took me a while to, I'm pretty new to this, but it took me a while to even get there with some of uh, my in-laws looking at it where I was Googling it and, hey, this looks like herbicide. No, no, it's been years. The cows have chewed all that up. So I think I'm just sharing that experience as it also ties in with that that sense of the unknown is sometimes then you make it change and kind of goes back to what someone said earlier, you don't know what you don't know. So sometimes you don't realize that you're going to try something new and and maybe there's an issue there that actually ends up totally hanging it up. And we were in that particular year, we were actually worse off using the herbicide compost in our high tunnels than if we just had stuck with our regular, very poor Wyoming soil. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I think this is really good. And thank you for sharing that story because th these are really good points. And it's important to talk about what doesn't work as well, as well as what does. I think Leroy said earlier, like the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and so, yeah, there is that unknown. And then those unintended um, results uh, sometimes, right, that, that happen uh, when we try something. And so how do we have um, a safety net in place or try it in a small space? And, and so what is needed to overcome those barriers? Because that unknown, and if it's a thin margin, um, what's going to happen if I try something and it doesn't work out? So that's a really good example. I also think it's a good segue uh, potentially to our, unless there's any other comments um, to our next question, um, which is uh, what mechanisms uh, would support producers in your area in achieving their soil health goals? So this is by no means an exhaustive list, uh, but some ideas uh, to consider and we'd love to hear what you think about them are education, demonstration projects, market incentives from supply chain partners, for example, pay for practices or price premiums, technical assistance, additional funding, carbon markets, ecosystem services markets other than carbon markets, reduced cost soil health testing and monitoring, and research on the benefits of soil health. And hopefully I haven't scared people off from the other choice. <laughs> And Carrie, just a question for you. Are, will we be able to capture the chat from, from our recording today? Um, I think so. Well, uh, Emily, I think is still on and she'll um, be able to, she'll get a recording or a, the, um, yes, <laughs> she'll get the transcripts from, from chat and can select that um, so we can send that to you. Because I know some people weren't able to join the poll everywhere and they're putting it in the chat and we, you can add those things and the, and the other comments and questions will be there. Okay, great. I'm trying to capture some notes, but I didn't know if I needed to. Well, yes, Emily just confirmed she could, <laughs> she'll do it. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not going to get it, but I have faith in Emily. She's wonderful. So yes. <laughs> thanks, okay. Emily. Terrific. Thanks, Carrie. And thanks, Emily, for, for helping with that. We appreciate it. And as a backup, I've been making copies of, every, of all the chat in a Word document. Oh, great. This sounds like we've got it covered then. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Again, we'd like to open up the floor um, to hear a little bit more about why you selected what you did. Uh, is there anyone that would like to, to get us started? Uh, 
I'll jump in here and and full disclosure, I checked almost every one of these because I do think they'd all be useful. But one of the things that really jumps out at me in terms of some of the discussion we've had at the Food Coalition, and, and this is also a really big thing that the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union has been discussing in terms of their uh, advocacy stances and priorities is the role that particularly family farmers, I mean, agriculture in general, but especially family scale farmers and producers, backyard producers can play in affecting overall climate health by, by building healthy soil systems. Because not only is that going to improve, if we can build soil health, not only is that going to improve the, um, the, the direct, oh, the retention of water, I mean, all the things that you guys talk about, but that's a carbon capture in itself, right? That's what we do when we grow plants. We're pulling carbon out of the out of the atmosphere and we're turning it into a biomass. And then if we leave it in the ground, then we're capturing it. And so that was a really long way of saying that one of the pieces the Rocky Mountain Farmers Union has has captured in their advocacy policies is pursuing economic incentives that rewards farmers for that, not just as a we want you to use regenerative practices and we'll subsidize that, but genuinely looking at it as this isn't just about agriculture, but also about climate change. And I think that economic incentives to help offset those costs of trying something new, trying something unknown, or getting the training to try it, and then acknowledging that that's playing a different economic role than just growing crops. I think all of that is is a very uh, forward thinking way of looking at this and affecting change. Thank you. I agree. You know, there's a lot of um, what might seem small, but collectively it becomes quite large. So it can make a big impact. What else do we have? We have education again, is there um, demonstration projects? Additional people funding. mentioned something along the lines of success stories in our area or learning from neighbors. Two people mentioned that in the chat. Yeah, Max, it's been kind of my observation in, in my wandering around life that in growing up on a ranch and having worked in agriculture all, in some aspect of it all my life, I've always found that folks in agriculture are great for looking over the fence and saying, you know, that you damn fool, it'll never work until it works. And then they ask you how you did it. So there is that looking over the barbed wire fence uh, saying, you know, it, it's not going to work. And then when they say it works, so I think uh, leading by example, uh is maybe a way and it kind of goes back to what penny was saying maybe wording uh terminology uh adam mentioned climate change well that in a lot of these areas is kind of a buzzword so or not a not a favorable buzzword so wording it you know what's regenerative agriculture what does that mean um so i think how we terminology or term things uh can make a difference in how uh, the word gets out and how it's successes, but I think a lot of it is the looking over the fence type thing. Um, you know, people see success and they're going to copy it, and that's agriculture. Folks in ag are pretty competitive, and so if something's working, uh, they will, you know, they're going to copy it and maybe improve on it, which is what life's all about. It makes me think that one thing that is list is missing from our list is peer to peer learning specifically. I do, Max. I, I and I, I really think that, you know, having worked in different states and different types of cropping systems and stuff. Yeah, I think that is the peer to peer thing is is, is going to be the success of uh, soil health, regenerative ag uh, and trying new crops, uh, you know, um, cover crops and things like that. I, I didn't get it put in this fall, but I'm going to do be doing cover crops in a garden that I won't be planting. And I'm going to be planting a whole bunch of different uh, plants just to see what I can do to my soil. Uh, I didn't get it done this fall, but I do have the seed and it's worked up. So yeah, peer to peer.
anyone else have anything they'd like to jump in there on? Um, Yeah, Kenny, uh, Kenny had a good comment in the chat section, I think. Uh, and it's also to learn what other uh, states are doing. I know you folks, because you've done presentations to the Sustainable Ecosystem Group, Penny, or uh, Natalie, in the past, what the folks in Colorado are doing and, and some of the successes that, you know, they've had down there in other states, Washington, North Dakota, and some of the other states. Yeah, I think there's a real opportunity. I, I think um, Derek was saying that, you know, one of the benefits that he has had is um, in his professional, uh, wearing his professional hat that's part of AG and, and being part of the National Wheat Committee or Commission, rather, he gets to talk to a lot of people around the country. And so he's gotten to learn from um, other producers and doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. And I think efforts like what we're talking about here have the same opportunity. Um, it doesn't have to be the same in Wyoming as it is in some of these other states. Wyoming is a very different state, but there are probably bits and pieces that can be pulled from the um, learning that other uh, areas have gone through um, and maybe modified or maybe they'll work just like they are. But I think there's a great opportunity to learn from others as to what's working. I will just say for transparency's sake, um, Ground Up Consulting has been deeply involved in the creation of the Colorado Soil Health Program. Um, and we've been starting to talk a little bit more about that with, uh, with some of the working groups in the collaborative and I'm certainly uh, excited to share a little bit more. Um, but really the first step uh, is to hear from folks about what's, uh, what the barriers are and what the opportunities might be. So that's, that's really where we're starting. I feel like Did you have that, something to say. Go ahead. I was just going to add, um, having worked with other clients on other issues, I think there's some um, pa some parallels. Um, thinking about landowners who provide habitat for wildlife, for example, they don't want to be paid for things if it's like a government handout. But when it's people acknowledging the value a value that they provide and that that is valued in a monetary way, that's something that people really, really like. So it's interesting thinking about Adam's point on like climate change and, and carbon markets and things like that. It seems like there's a lot of skepticism for those things, but when producers can be acknowledged for what a of environmental service that they are providing, <laughs> whether it's habitat or carbon sequestration or whatever it is, um, then that's uh, that seems more like a fair exchange for folks than if it's seen as like a government handout or something. At least that's what I hear from other clients. <laughs> and along that, Carrie, you know, I heard a, a rancher that I had a lot of respect for said, we're telling each other what a good job we're doing but we're not telling the right right people and mm -hmm. and with the uh emphasis on climate change and all of those things whatever the buzzword you know people in agriculture are getting hammered about the emissions and stuff like that so i think you know if we do a good job telling our story as ag producers what we're doing to to protect the soil improve the soil improve our animal health and stuff you know i think people in agriculture have got to start telling that story to the consumer uh, and to the media, because right now they're just telling each other what a good job we're doing. And and I, it was a guy I had a lot of respect for, uh, known him for a long time, and and uh, that was his comment. I think I think that's one we need to take to heart. Really good point, Leroy. Thanks for sharing that. I yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. I've had similar conversations where. We tend to be preaching to the choir to use that term. Um, and sometimes, you know, we need to find a way to tell our story, um, as you said, to the media and to the community at large. So that's a really good point. And these folks actually were doing uh, holistic management. This was back in the 80s, uh, it, it doing some really innovative things. And I'm sure folks were wondering why they were doing it, but it was very successful in a rocky area, too. Yeah, there's a lot of things we can do, and I, I think it comes down to, to learning from each other. So, um, and then and then showing off those things that we that we've accomplished. Okay, well we're we're getting towards the end of the day. We want to make sure to <laughs> let you off a little early here, since we know it's been a long day. So we only have one more question. 
Um, this is around education specifically um, and is really going to be something that the uh, education work group takes into consideration when they're uh, forming their recommendations. Um, what additional educational resources are needed to support producers in your area? Economic impacts of soil health practices, soil health testing and monitoring, the benefits of soil health, strategies for improving soil health, carbon or other ecosystem services markets or other. Anyone want to say um, some a few words about uh, one, one of the choices they selected? I'll just hop on real quick and say that I think that it would be helpful to have um, like your uh, agents going out to farms if if you know if people want that, like um, like doing sort of a home visit to go and do the soil testing, showing up on the farm to help along with the process. Great idea. I'm gonna tag on, on what you just said in the fact that <clears throat> I think first of all, you have to show them and by doing, by going to their place and saying what you know first of all oh look at all these great things that you're already doing here's how you can improve this will help the you know the economic economics is always a big part of it and 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 expressing the benefits of the soil health but i i kind of have to agree um that um i think somebody said it earlier you know um seeing the ranch or doing it in person and those sorts of things are very important and maybe that might be the most efficient because then you're seeing what they're doing already can give them the options of this what is what you could do to improve and the benefits of improving your soil will economically impact you like this and here's the strategy of how to get it so and those were the three top things that i marked in mind because they're all connected It's a really good way to put it all together um, in sort of a laying out a nice plan, planned approach there. I think that the uh, involvement of NRCS and, and our conservation districts in this whole project have, you know, ha has been really encouraging because they do interact directly with the producers. They are really important. They do go out and conduct, you know, all kinds of field testing and whatnot. And they were at the head of the head of the class when we put our um, uh, field trip this summer to different ranches together. So uh, yeah, I think anything we can do to help them, though they're understaffed, helped and encouraged them, uh, maybe could um, could help with this whole project. Other great comments. Anyone else? Any other ideas on how we can deliver more or how more of the education can be delivered? I think we already talked about that in one of our earlier questions. I think some of you have already spoken to soil health testing um, and monitoring. Any other comments on that particular? Yeah, as my part-time hat in uh, extension office, uh, people will take a soil test, send it off to a certified lab, then they get the test back and they don't really understand what the test is telling them. Um, and they don't also realize that, you know, you can get a plant tissue sample as to what the plant needs, not just what the soil needs. And so there's different ways of testing what the what the crop actually needs and and that so i think some labs like ward lab and i'm not sure about csu they're actually getting into doing a lot more in depth on soil health and stuff so i think as the soil health effort moves forward then 
I think a lot of our soil labs will be getting, uh, I know Ward Lab, because I've sitting on some of their webinars, uh, they're getting into the soil health, more and more intensive testing on, on, you know, what's going on below the ground. So understanding what your soil test tells you, I think is important. Absolutely. Any other comments? We've gone through the, the questions that we had prepared um, for you. These are the questions that we've used at each of our listening sessions. And so, so that we can get good um, qualitative and quantitative um, data. Um, and as we said, we'll be um, putting all of this together and reporting on, out on it at our January meeting. And so for those of you who might not have already joined the collaborative, um, you'll find a way to reach out to us if you go to the uh, Ground Up Consulting um, website. Um, just there's a there's the button um, right there. Max is showing you join the collaborative, and then that way you'll be on our email list. Um, you can fill out the surveys there. Um, there's some other materials there if you have questions about them. But please fill out the surveys. Um, join the mailing list so that we can invite you to our January meeting for the full collaborative and you'll get to hear um, what other other participants have said. Um, so that's what we have as our listening session. Um, uh, we have a few minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Leroy. Yeah, as a question, Natalie, what kind yeah. of response did you get? Uh, was it Wednesday and Thursday at the resource rendezvous? Did you get a pretty good response uh, turnout? Yeah, we did. Um, we were really excited to be um, invited to go to the Wyoming Natural Resource Rendezvous. That was the conference hosted by Wyoming Stock Growers Association, Wyoming Wool Growers Association, and Wyoming Association of Conservation Districts. It was a really well attended conference. There are a lot of people there. Um, which was exciting to see. We did host a listening session. We had pretty much a full room. Um, I don't know if we were able to get an actual count of how many people were in the room, but we'll be able to tell from the poll everywhere results how many people participated. Um, and then Leanna Boggs um, was able to share in their general session an overview, much like we've shared with you today. Um, and we, after both sessions, we had a little uptick in people visiting our booth, picking up the surveys and completing them on the spot. And then we had cards available um, and many people picked those up. Lots of people came by and answered questions or asked questions and we tried to answer them. Um, so we felt like it was a really uh, good, positive interaction um, and, and well attended. So were you, one of the speaker series or you just had a booth there uh so you you know did you have a slot on the agenda we had two slots on the agenda we okay. um we had a we were able to have one of the breakout sessions dedicated um to this effort um including a, a feedback um listening session like we've done here today so we had a, a full breakout session and then we had another session in the general session um, where we were able to talk about the efforts um, and encourage people to take the surveys and participate. Okay, good. Yeah. And a big thanks to Jim Magagna for making that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any other questions from the group in terms of if, you know, just a general question about the the collaborative or or any anything else? Really, we're happy to take those questions. We've completed our listening session um, at this point. So thank you all for hanging in there. We know it's been a long day. Last call for any questions before Natalie and, and Max and crew take off. And if you haven't joined the coalition, there is a, if you go to the website, there is a join button down there. I think Adam gave a pretty good plug at the beginning. And so as we wrap up today, uh, be sure to become a member. There's a lot of things going on. We're trying to make some uh, positive changes in uh, working with small producers and, and that. So thanks to Adam for putting the plug in at the end or at the beginning, and we'll put a plug in at the end. So wildfood.org and and uh, join us. Uh, we we need new we need new members uh, to add to our numbers. It's an all volunteer army. There was a question um, here. Have you reached out to irrigation districts as far as um, other connections? It sounds like soil districts, but maybe not so much on irrigation districts. 
we have, to my knowledge, have not reached out um, specifically to irrigation districts. So that's a really good suggestion. Thank you. And as Max said in the chat, thanks so much for having us and um, yeah, participating in the listening session. It's so important to have your input. So thank you.